Yeah, dear Gülchen, dear Hans, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, this morning. Uh, my talk uh, is, is uh, based on a, on a little PowerPoint presentation. I hope you don't mind. My wife didn't like it, but I said, no, as a professor, you need to be pedagogical. So people need to take notes and be structured and so on. So we'll see. So the, the topic is private philanthropy as a competitor of the welfare state. So it's, it's, it's a topic it's a little bit as, as an offspring of uh, my book, so we'll make a little commercial uh, interruption now. So it's a, so it's a book that's, that's just being published, will be delivered next week. Uh, Die Wirtschaft und das Unentgeltliche, The Economy and Gratuitous Goods, uh, and an English version will be forthcoming at the end of the year, or early next year, uh, published by the Mises Institute, uh, under the title Abundance, Generosity, and the State. Okay, so it deals with all gratuitous goods, gratuitous goods being, uh, of course, gifts on the one hand, but then also um, uh, individual action dedicated to the development of a science or of an art, something which you uh, devote yourself to, to a cause that is not yourself. As often as yourself who is, who is uh, the agent there, so you're deciding to do this, but the object of the beneficiary is, is not your own person, but something else than you, yourself. And uh, then in a wider sense, also among gratuitous goods, we have all the uh, spontaneous benefits that result from human action, uh, both within the market and outside of the market. So in many ways, we benefit from what others do without having to pay a single penny for, for these benefits. For example, um, uh, in the word of example, right, we have uh, examples, good examples uh, delivered by others, bad examples delivered by others. Uh, benefit us in so many ways. We take inspiration from good examples, we take uh, warnings from bad examples, and we don't have to pay for these things. Right? Then there, of course, there are various uh, uh, positive externalities uh, resulting from the market process uh, with which economists are uh, familiar and so on. So it's a very wide uh, topic and it interlaces with uh, traditional economics in various ways. Um, of course, this uh, book is, is based on uh, Austrian economics, so the, the, uh, the, the basic foundation, the praxeological foundation of these, uh, this theoretical work uh, has been laid by, by Ludwig von Mises, so I'm developing this. And one of the subjects that I touch is indeed uh, philanthropy. It's not the main focus, but it's one of the things that I touch. And of course, the welfare state, because the welfare state is uh, coercive. Um, gratuitousness, right? so it's not true gratuitousness because it's based on the violation of property rights, right? If you, if you uh, play Robin Hood and you rob other people in order to give uh, that money to, to others, uh, to still others, well, that's not uh, truly a gift, so that's not really truly a gratuitous gift, but that's robbery, right? And then, of course, you can say, well, but Robin Hood, he was just uh, robbing the evil prince who had uh, taken the money from taxpayers and so on. Well, even in that case, it wouldn't be a gift it would be restitution. Right? So if you take money away from a robber and give it to the people to whom it is due, well, that's not a gift. You don't, don't give anything. Maybe you give your own activity, you dedicate yourself to justice, something. Okay, that's, that's different, but the money in any case is not a true gift. Well, uh, Mises himself uh, developed various elements of uh, the economics of gratuitous goods. For example, uh, his discussion uh, of uh, entrepreneurial action and of the creative uh, genius. The creative genius is dedicated to a cause. He pursues something that is precisely not himself. He does not try to earn as much money as possible or to aggrandize his, his own image in, in the eyes of others. He is dedicated to writing the Ninth Century or to, to, to write uh, sonnets and, and whatever to art, to science, and uh, he creates great things from which others benefit in various ways. But he's... Uh, He's a little bit outside of the um, uh, uh, usual bond that you have in labor relations, right? If you have an employee, you pay him to do certain things. Well, that's, these are things that reasonably can be done uh, by uh, work, right? Whereas writing the Ninth Symphony, you could not possibly commission such a work. In fact, you don't know it before you see it, before it's eventually there, right? So Mises recognized that this was outside of ordinary economics and uh, did various other things as well in his book. And what I do is to, well, develop this in much more detail, systematize it, and show that gratuitous goods are interwoven with um, uh, the market economy 
and with uh, uh, self-centered uh, uh, actions, which of course, which I don't uh, uh, denigrate. So I think this is uh, perfectly legitimate and, and, and good and beneficial to others in so many ways. Right? So it's not a, a, a claim that, well, we should now become all altruists and all be completely only devoted to science and, and, to, and to the arts and, and so on. That's not the point, but it shows, well, that also exists. It plays an important uh, part in human life, and it is interwoven with this, the self-interested activities of the market that are so central and so fundamental in many uh, ways uh, and uh, contributes to the overall picture that we should have of uh, economy and society. Mises also inspired an uh, important figure for us, uh, important for us today in any case, uh, whose name is Richard Cornwell. This is this man, so the, the, the picture was taken uh, well, in the, in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, he was born in uh, 1927. Uh, I, I think he died in 2011 or something like this. Uh, so he was a member of Mises' uh, seminar as a young man. He uh, came to New York in the late 1940s and then stayed in Mises' seminar for more than 10 years. I don't know exactly. I, he said he was in the seminar in the 1960s. So he knew Mises' thought uh, very well. He worked for the uh, William Folker Fund in those days. His brother, um, uh, oh, I forgot the first name of the brother, his older, older brother uh, was the director of the William Folker Fund, uh, which, which paid for a Hayek salary at the University of, of uh, Chicago, uh, which funded um, uh, travel expenditure of Mises Hayek and various, various other uh, Austrians and libertarians. Uh, to the Mont Pelerin Society in Europe and, and so on, uh, funded book uh, publication projects just uh, su such as Man, Economy and State and, and other books. So the Volker Fund played a very important role. It was then dissolved in the, in the early uh, 1960s. Um, uh, Richard Con uh, uh, Cornwell, uh, uh, distinct contrast uh, to his uh, brother, um, then deviated a bit from libertarianism. He got disenchanted with uh, libertarianism because he felt that um, okay, she, uh, his uh, perception was that libertarianism was too unilaterally concerned with promoting the market. And as far as he was concerned, he thought, well, uh, we, we need to distinguish not only between the market and the state, so taking opposition to the state and promoting market activities, but we need also to uh, uh, appreciate for its true value uh, a third sector that exists next to the market and next to the state, which he proposed to call the independent sector. And uh, this is, uh, or has been in the past 20, 30 years, a very fashionable uh, topic in, in, in the social sciences uh, with uh, lots of studies dedicated to analyzing, well, how do nonprofits operate, uh, what, what are hybrid businesses, uh, uh, social enterprise, and, and things like this, so where the objective would be not just to earn profits, but to pursue other uh, objectives simultaneously. And of course, this is uh, manifest also today in um, uh, all these, these ESG investing uh, initiatives, right? So the point is, yeah, we want to make a profit, but we also want to improve the world, to make the uh, world a better place by pursuing ecological, social, and government. Uh, objectives, right? So uh, Richard Cornwell was actually the first one to conceptualize this idea. So he was a forerunner, and in that respect, it's quite interesting uh, for us. He, he himself took his inspiration from um, a well-known French author in the 19th century, namely uh, Alexis de, de Tocqueville. So Tocqueville traveled to the U.S. in the early 19th century and then uh, published um, in the 1830s, uh, in 1840, two volumes of a very famous book, uh, La Democracy en Amérique, uh, Democracy in America. And here, um, uh, Tocqueville um, uh, gave a, a fascinating characterization of American society in, in those days, uh, which is still worth a while to, to, to read uh, still today and is widely read still today. Uh, and most notably, he emphasized not the market economy uh, as being characteristic of what America is all about, but uh, associative life, clubs, uh, voluntary, volunteerism, as we would say it, uh, today. So Americans, in order to solve any social problems that they might confront, uh, we need to build a road, we need to help the poor, uh, we, we need to improve our environment in various ways, we need to clamp on, uh, down on crime and so on. 
they were not uh, turning first to market and paying people, well, they would do this as well, but they would first of all uh, establish an association and join forces in order to settle the problem, so it's community uh, action. Now that was inspiration for uh, Richard Cornwell. I said, well, so this seems to be the key for uh, renewing with this glorious past. We need to emphasize uh, this third sector, this independent sector, civil society, as we would often say uh, today. Right? So we need, just, uh, uh, we st uh, need to stop focusing on the uh, opposition between state and, and market and say the market have come to dominate the scene only in the 20th century, but there was a glorious past in which the independent sector prime was prime and, and state and market were small, and we should retain, uh, return to, uh, to, to this glorious past. Right? So this was his way of reclaiming uh, the American dream. Uh, American dream, uh, of course, being uh, uh, the idea that uh, you only ask for life, liberty, and the well, the liberty to per pursue your own happiness, and uh, the conviction that uh, without having any guarantees from the, from the state, from the church or others, just by hard work in, in cooperation uh, with others, uh, and, and uh, by saving and reinvesting your, your earnings, well, uh, you will be able to lead a happy life and uh, take care of, well, gain, gain material, well, may maybe not affluence, but comfortable life and, uh, be able to help your own family and, and, and care also for others. So that's the idea. Now, of course, as you know, today we are quite removed from this. Uh, I've, I've uh, looked up uh, uh, jokes about uh, the American dream. In fact, there are quite a few, few jokes out, you know, because uh, many people are disenchanted and don't believe the American dream uh, is dead, right? So uh, one, one, one of these jokes was, well, well it, it is a dream because you have to sleep in order to believe it. And, and, and the, um, the other one was, uh, yeah, Michael Jackson is the epitome of the American dream. Only in America, uh, a poor black boy could become a rich white woman. <laughs> now the uh, American dream has you know, come under fire not only because of uh, Michael Jackson and, and other uh, strange cases of this sort, uh, but also because, as, as we know, that it, it is becoming increasingly difficult for younger generations to, to live this dream and to uh, work their, their way out of poverty. Um, and there are reasons for this that we'll discuss uh, a bit later down the way. So it's not surprising that in our day, uh, there are certain siren songs, right? Like by uh, this gentleman, for example. So his, uh, his book had, had the title uh, the Audacity of Hope, but the subtitle is right, um, Thoughts on uh, Reclaiming uh, the, the American Dream. Right? So it's, it's, uh, it resonates with, with Cornwell's book uh, from the 1960s. I, I'm pretty sure that he didn't know the book when he was writing it because, oh, okay, I won't go into this. Uh, but in any case, what, what we know that this gentleman had a very different uh, conception of uh, reclaiming the American Dream. It was very state-based, right? So we we, we do this top down, we, we set into place uh, well, an army of social workers, and I don't know what, we transform uh, companies, commercial enterprise, and so on by uh, infiltrating them with ESG criteria and so on. So that's a very special way of reclaiming the American dream, which was not Richard Cornwell's idea. Cornwell argued that the independent sector had come, um, had been, been neglected in the 20th century because for some reasons, which he doesn't really discuss, uh, it failed to adopt modern technology. But now like, technology does not merely mean computer and stuff like this, but also uh, commercial uh, te uh, techniques and organizational techniques that have been developed in the business sector, so in the, in the corporate world and so on. So Cornwell thought that if um, private associations, clubs, uh, non-governmental organizations and so on, were to adopt modern business techniques, they could play a greater role in uh, uh, solving uh, the, the, the problems, social problems of America, poverty, uh, inequalities, and so on. They could play an important role in funding uh, uh, research and uh, therefore uh, uh, solve problems related to cancer and, and, and whatever. 
So once uh, these associations are equipped with modern uh, technique, well, they could enter into competition with uh, government welfare agencies, the housing department, uh, labor department, and so on, by proposing to Congress uh, private solutions. And then uh, the, the members of Congress, well, they could uh, vote laws, and uh, presently they would invariably uh, decide to entrust the solution of this and that problem to some government agency, but if there is private, is a private alternative, well, then they might vote for different laws and say, well, we'll entrust this to a private, uh, uh, private work, to volunteering work. Right? So that was his vision. Right? Now, how realistic is this, uh, is this Cornwellian way of reclaiming the American dream? In what follows, I will uh, present four criticisms, is, uh, if you wish, by focusing first on the independent sector today, just make a little stock taking. What does the so-called independent sector, that what is not expressly business uh, or uh, state, look like today? What's the landscape? Has Cornwell's vision become true? Or has it improved the situation as compared to what it was in the 1960s? Uh, my second point will be to emphasize that one uh, very fundamental weakness of his whole conception is a confusion between the legal form of any uh, human form of cooperation and its economic nature. Uh, then I'll emphasize the various ways in which governments co compete and which make it finally very unlikely that any private organization and direct competition with government may succeed. And finally, I'll uh, uh, discuss the the impact of uh, government interventionism on philanthropy uh, in general. So how does the independent sector look like today? So we have a whole landscape of, well, we have business organizations, BOs, government organizations, GOs, and then we have uh, NGOs, non-government organizations, so that's the third sector, right? the independent sector. And uh, I would say there are also a lot of PNGOs, uh, pseudo non-government organizations, right? So uh, organizations that look like they were independent of business and, and government, but truly are either extensions of the corporate world or are extensions of, of governments. And unfortunately, the latter uh, are very important today. So I think we can distinguish uh, between uh, three main types of uh, uh, independent sector organizations, NGOs, we have, on the one hand, fiscal front organization. Now, that's my, it's not in the literature. This is my, my expression, right? Fiscal front organizations. Then we have political front organizations. And then finally, we have genuine associations, OK? Now, the first two ones are PNGOs, and uh, the, the, only the third one is a genuine NGO, OK? Now, the problem is that the, the first two dominate the scene, and increasingly so, and the third one is in decline. That's the fundamental fact. Right? So uh, fiscal front organizations, this concerns most notably foundations. Uh, Anglo-Saxon law, both in the US uh, and in, in the UK, and everything that depends from the UK, gives extremely uh, lavish uh, conditions for transmitting property through foundations. So you can run your business uh, through a foundation. In Holland, by the way, it's, it's, it's not much different. Holland is also great liberty for foundations, uh, not taxed. There's no tax taxation of their income. They can even make profitable investments, stuff like this. Uh, they can trans uh, admit property to the next generation so it can be structured in such a way that only the family members run the foundation and so on. It's just a way to, to avoid any taxation of, of wealth and, uh, and income. Now, that's, of course, fine, right? From a libertarian point of view, there's not much to be said uh, against this. That, that's good. In fact, the, the only thing they would say, well, I, I would wish that everybody would benefit from this, right? So as a matter of fact, the problem that we have here is that uh, a fiscal fronts uh, serve essentially affluent people who can uh, afford to pay the lawyers who structure this thing and who watch uh, any legal threats that might uh, arise and, and help them in, in, in preserving their property, which is already a good thing. Right? Now, um, to some estimates, uh, in the US, there seems to be, of, relatively speaking, more important than uh, uh, in the UK. So I've uh, given you here this, this quote from a gentleman who uh, studied these things about 10 years ago, George McCulley, 
Uh, and so he established a catalog for philanthropy for his native Massachusetts. And he found that 75% of tax exempt entities are primarily self serving, that is, uh, uh, supported by, provided, providing benefits for their own members. And only 10% are indisputable the private initiatives for public good focusing on quality of life and engaged in public fundraising. So the philanthropic marketplace and the remaining 15% are para-philanthropic, some, somewhere between the two. Right? So um, that's the situation. And uh, uh, it's even uh, pushed to, to, to an extreme in the case of very large uh, uh, philanthropy. Um, where we get, in fact, to, to the second sort of category, the political front organizations, right? Very large philanthropies so the Bill and uh, Melinda Gates uh, Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, Bertelsmann in Germany, and so on. Right? So it's very large. So uh, uh, here, uh, uh, indeed, right, the, there's so much money involved that uh, these people, I mean, they don't have to worry about caring for their own family members, right? So that's for the, so the middle class millionaire, right? So people who have 10, 20 billions or something that set up a foundation and provide for their own family members, and usually they're not interested in anything else. I don't, again, I don't say that's bad, right? So that, that's, all, that's, that's perfectly fine, it's okay. Uh, but here, in the case of the mega foundation, of course, we, as we all know, they, uh, uh, try to have and do have significant impact on uh, the political life of the countries in which they're, they're active. Right? And so they're usually very strongly associated with uh, governments in their place on which they depend in various ways in which they profit in, in various ways. Right? Uh, so um, in the literature, this is then called philanthrocapitalism, right? capitalism driven by, organized by, oriented by very large uh, uh, foundations. I prefer to call this uh, philanthrocronism because that's really what it is. It has, been, uh, it has been known for a very long time. It has been known in antiquity, um, uh, in, in, in Greece, uh, in, in Rome. There, uh, I'm not aware of any study, but the historian Paul Vane he, he studied uh, the case of Greece. Uh, and uh, he, he called this, uh, well, it has been called at the time, uh, 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 so it's, it, it's, it can be translated uh, um, liberally as, as do, do goodism, something like this, right? So it's, they had the, the same conception uh, as we have, right? So people who do good to the government, so very rich people in, in Athens and so on, they would assume out of their own purse uh, certain public activities, funding an army, uh, uh, repairing a canal or something like this. And this was their way of, of giving back, right? Giving back to the community. And in fact, uh, it was sort of an exchange because on the one hand, they, they stood to benefit from various legal privileges uh, that, that were at the foundation uh, of their wealth. Most, most notably, lax monetary policy existed already in Greece, but that's a different chapter. Maybe you talk for another year. Right? So they had amassed an enormous wealth. And on the other hand, then it was expected, well, they give some something back. Right? So we have here a characteristic feature of the do-gooder throughout our uh, ages. Right? Uh, some do-gooders, of course, they have earned their money all on their own without any uh, government monopoly or uh, helping hand from the coercive state. Uh, but many of them have, right? And then they feel obliged, they have a bad conscience, they feel obliged to, to, to give back. And then in our day, they are very often uh, advocates of higher taxation of incomes and wealth, right? It's not just that there's uh, so much, right? For example, I think uh, Warren Buffett has said uh, things to this, uh, uh, to this effect. And the most famous uh, literary expression of this mindset in modern times uh, um, is, is Carnegie's uh, uh, book published in 1899, I believe, The Gospel of Wealth. Let this sink down, The Gospel of Wealth, right? And so he explains, well, the wealthy man has obligations toward uh, society and so on. And of course, wealth should be taxed, uh, income should be taxed, and he should do good uh, in various ways. Now, again, of course, I'm not opposed to people doing good to others and to, to themselves and so in various ways. But the point here is, right, we have excessive wealth with very large fortunes, which are often earned by uh, government support. And which then in turn uh, lead their beneficiaries to claim for even more government interventions. So that's philanthrocronism. 
Next, we have uh, the political front organizations. So here we have NGOs, they are uh, really PNGOs, pseudo non-governmental uh, organizations. And again, we have a very long tradition uh, in former times. One of the earliest uh, forms in modern times was, was privateering, uh, that is um, uh, pirates, private enterprise, uh, recruited by the government for, for naval warfare. So the government issues them, um, I don't know the, the legal expression, a letter saying uh, whatever crimes you commit, if they are done for the benefit of the crown, that's okay. So uh, the French privateers, their mission was to hijack uh, uh, British boats and, and Spanish boats, and the British had their privateers, so they were hijacking French boats and Spanish boats and, and so on. So there was a whole uh, industry, right? And of course, we know this uh, on our own day, right? So it's the famous or infamous Wagner uh, operation, right? There, there are various uh, similar um, uh, commercial companies in the US, uh, in France, and in, uh, in other Western countries, right? which are conducting covered uh, military operations for the benefit of, of the government, very often commissioned by the government, uh, but which would not be legitimate if carried out by a public organization, right? So they really do the dirty work that nobody else, uh, no, no public organization, no government organization could carry out. Uh, in, in banking, we have the same thing. Uh, I'll give you just in monetary policy one, one example. Um, uh, central banks uh, may usually not own shares of companies in their own country for a perfectly good reason, because if they were allowed to do this, then of course you could from one day to another transform that country into a socialist commonwealth, right? The central bank has unlimited possibility to produce money, so they could buy all the shares on the stock market right, and thereby transform the economy into a socialist economy. So that's not really what we want. Therefore, central banks may only typically buy debt instruments. So they may make uh, promises of payments or debt, debt instruments, but not shares, not, not shares in property. Now, while this concerns essentially the shares of uh, companies listed on the domestic market, it does not concern companies listed on the foreign markets. Right? So nothing prevents the Federal Reserve from purchasing shares issued in, in Europe or in Asia. Nothing prevents the uh, central banks of the euro system from uh, purchasing American shares, shares of, of US companies on, on some other markets. And in fact, as, as we know, uh, by, by just looking at the balance sheets and occasional uh, communicative slips, right? because sometimes they, they say things that they should, should, better, should not have said, well, we know that there's some sort of consultation going on. Right? So the Americans are buying European stocks in exchange for European buying American stocks and so on. Right? So the same thought. Right? So we have a, a, a privateering uh, enterprise. Then, of course, we have NGOs engaged in military in intelligence and foreign policy interference. Uh, one very famous uh, case, I mean, for, I mean for, for those who know a little bit that literature, is uh, the National Endowment for Democracy, which uh, by all intents and purposes seems to be very clearly a CIA front organization. Right? And what they do is, well, where in all the countries in which they are active, in which they are allowed to, to operate, well, they prepare color revolutions. Right? So uh, takeovers of government by, by groups that are um, friendly uh, or even directed by, uh, by the Americans, by the US government. So we have this, right? And uh, of course, we might ask, OK, so thinking back of uh, um, Cornwell, where is the volunteering here, right? Where, uh, where are the volunteers? Right? There, there are no volunteers, right? All these people working for fiscal front organization, uh, political front organizations, they're all very richly remunerated. Um, uh, there is no volunteer work here at all involved, right? So where we do, uh, and of course, there's no competition because there's central coordination. Where we do find still vo volunteers is in genuine organizations. So we have here churches, fraternities, neighbor associations, right, uh, sports clubs, um, professional organizations, Rotary Club, Lions, and, and things like this. Okay, so here we have two volunteerism still at work. And what do we observe here? Well, what we observe is declining membership. Uh, both uh, quantitative and qualitative. So qualitative, the typical uh, metric that is used is how many people do you have that are only writing checks and how many people are actually uh, doing the work, right? really show up to the meetings, show up to, uh, at the activities and so on. 
and according to both metrics, uh, membership is uh, is declining. Right? Uh, yeah, so that's that's the situation. So clearly, we can say, okay, whatever the merits of uh, Richard Cornwell's reclaiming the American dream is on theoretical grounds, uh, in practice, it it didn't turn around the um, uh, the tendency. The tendency was continue toward the destruction of the genuine civil uh, society, the true independent sector. And what we got since the 1960s is a whole plethora of fake, of uh, pseudo non-governmental uh, organizations. Okay, the next point is um, the confusion between legal form and economic uh, nature. So uh, uh, Cornwell uh, proposes uh, uh, to emphasize this, as far as non-state organizations are concerned, the, the huge difference between for-profit versus non-profit business versus civil society, uh, market versus the independent sector, and so on. Right? And that uh, distinction is uh, uh, questionable because um, the objective with which an organization is run is, of course, constrained by its legal form, but it's not fully determined by the legal form. And for example, as we have just seen, you can run a foundation as a for-profit enterprise. And that is today typically the case. Right? It's, uh, we've uh, uh, seen the, 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 the quotation that I gave you uh, gave, uh, just before in Massachusetts, more than 75% of our foundations are extensions of a commercial enterprise. Right? So you, can, you have a legal form which is, uh, is a non-profit, but in fact, the people running it are operating like, it, uh, operating it like a, like a for-profit. Right? You can operate a think tank which is legally non-profit. You can operate it in a for-profit way. You can say, well, okay, I have my revenue. These are the people who donate money to, to the thing. I have my cost expenditure. The people who are writing paper for me, papers for me, and the student seminars that are organized and so on. And then you, you try to maximize your revenue. You try to maximize your profit. Nothing prevents you from doing this. Right? Or very few things prevent you from doing this. Some constraints. Right? So the spirit with which you run an organization has little to do with uh, the, the legal setup. Same thing as far as companies are concerned. I've, I've seen companies uh, in, in the past 10 years or so that uh, legally were commercial enterprises, but really it, it was just a collection of assets held by some wealthy man and they just had a quiet life uh, and were enjoying whatever their, their villas and, uh, and, and cars and jets and, and, and so on. And, had no intention of, of increasing the capital base of the company of, uh, of uh, gaining any revenue. That is possible. Right? It's possible to do it. You have the legal form of a commercial enterprise, but you don't act as you would expect an entrepreneur to act. Uh, and, okay, families, okay, that's of course more extreme, but of course you can run a family like a business. Right? Oh, yeah, I have revenue, I have uh, costs, oh, all these eaters at my table and so on, and then I want to maximize revenue over the next, next few years, right? I want to preserve my old age uh, revenue, raising enough kids to make me independent of, of the welfare state, and I don't know what. Right? So it's wrong to identify legal form and uh, economic objective. Right? The true opposition remains the one between coercion and liberty, between the political means and economic means, as Franz Oppenheimer put it, Coercion and freedom, interventionism versus private property. Here we have a categorical difference. The third point is a brief consideration about how uh, governments uh, compete. Is it possible to compete with private associations against the welfare state? Well, first of all, governments have one means that nobody else has by definition because governments are uh, by definition, the monopoly of organized violence in a country. Right? All other organizations of a similar sort are criminal uh, organizations by definition. Which reminds me of another great joke. Right? There's this young boy that after, at, at the age of eight comes to see his father, and the father is reading the newspaper and says, Daddy, finally I know what I want to do in my life. Father doesn't look up from the paper. So what is it? I'll make a career in, in organized crime. Father still doesn't look up and said, public or private? <laughs> and uh, right, so 
I mean, also you have the mafia and so on, right? But, but these are combated with the organized, right? the legitimate forces of the state by the, with the support of, of the entire population, right? So that's, a, if you can mobilize uh, uh, violations of the, the standard rules, private property, uh, integrity of, of your own life, of your own body, we've seen it in the case of, of uh, the, the, the COVID policies where in many countries, many countries were on the verge of uh, mandating uh, vaccinations to the population, literally coming with a syringe and uh, f forcing people to get injections and, and so on, right? So that's what the state can do. And no other organization can, can, uh, can do this. Now that gives certain competitive advantages. Most notably, it allows the government to hijack competitors uh, or at least to crowd them out. Right? It can hijack uh, uh, competitors uh, in the past, if you just look the, the main, through the main cases, right, uh, theology uh, is bringing uh, churches and religious movement under state control, uh, bring money under state control, uh, bring, bring the law under state control, security organizations, communications, education, utilities, even labor unions, and of course the welfare state. Right? Now there are certain priorities, but the priorities change historically. So historically we've observed that governments first focus on the most important things, the most fundamental things. In the case of theology, it never worked fully out, at least not in the Western world. Uh, but as far as money and the law, is, these were the first targets. Right? And they were very successfully hijacked already in antiquity. In fact, we don't know any uh, civilizations that, that, that have uh, governments in which money and law are not controlled by the government. And then the next in line, but it was really only next in line, is the security apparatus, then later came media communication and so on. Crowding out, of course, the, the basic uh, technique for crowding a competitor out is just to outlaw it. So in, in, in money, law, security, and education, well, money, law, and security in all Western countries, no other competitors are allowed. Government doesn't compete with uh, uh, private uh, money producers with uh, private, I mean, there's some uh, at the periphery, there's some uh, legal um, uh, services that are private in international arbitration and so on, also in security, there are Wagner's and, and others, which are sometimes front organizations, but you might, may have a security firm that just is, uh, watch, provides watchman services, night, night watchman for your company and, uh, and other things. And so you can crowd them out and uh, of course, what governments can do is to tax revenue and the capital invested uh, in such uh, uh, competitors and it can subsidize state organizations. For example, in France uh, and in Germany, the educational system goes down the drain. So parents very often think of well, setting up their own schools. The problem is they have to, to fund out of taxpayer money, that out of their own revenue, they have to fund the state-run schools and have to pay additional money uh, in order to set up their own uh, schooling organizations, if they have the possibility, the legal uh, liberty to, to, to set them up at all. So under these uh, conditions, of course, the prospects of any genuinely private welfare competitors are dim. Right? So we would expect them to operate at the margin there where, it's, where the state doesn't reach and, and so on. But we can say that as soon as it becomes significant, practically and therefore also politically, governments will become interested in the thing because they, they want to gain the loyalty of the population. The loyalty of the population is gained by providing services that are obviously uh, relevant, obviously important for, for the people. So if a private organization operates successfully in, the, in that field, well, it's likely to, to be taken over by the government. Finally, uh, we can say a few things about uh, the impact of interventionism on uh, philanthropy in general. Right? Uh, by considering that genuine philanthropy um, involves uh, donations of time and money, and this is always based on genuine devotion, as I've said in my introductory remarks, uh, the gratuitousness of the, of the service that is provided uh, by, by justice, and right? so you cannot provide really a genuine uh, uh, donation by violating other people's rights. You need to work within uh, the rights and obligations that are just uh, and that, that are pre-established, and you have to do it out of your own savings, savings of time, savings of money. That's genuine philanthropy. So in other words, right, genuine philanthropy is always based on the ab ability and willingness right, to provide donations. 
Now interventionism destroys both. Okay, or tends to. I mean, tends to destroy both. It's never fully destroyed, but I mean, it's diminished. First of all, as we know, interventionism impoverishes households, right? Because what in governments do is to reallocate the existing resources out of projects in which they would uh, provide genuine improvements according to the judgment of the owners and into projects that the government likes, like equality, ecology, uh, social and govern governance and, and so on. So uh, all these projects, what they have in common is that nobody really feels they are important or make a contribution to uh, creating additional value. Because if they made a contribution, it would not be necessary to force anybody uh, to, to adopt them. So whenever we have uh, an ESG policy or a DEI policy, diversity, equi equ equity, and inclusion right, imposed on an organization, it's an invariable sign that the costs are going up without any corresponding increase in revenue. So government is impoverishing us uh, through uh, taxation, regulation, and uh, the non-productive use of the uh, resources. Then, as we've seen, uh, government crowds out private welfare. Uh, the welfare state uh, has crowded out um, uh, uh, welfare activities in all, all over the Western world. And the most dramatic example is uh, the United Kingdom. Um, there's an excellent book uh, on, the, on the topic. Oh, what's the, what's the author? Uh, the title is The Welfare State We're, We're In. And the author is James... Bartholomew, thank you. Excellent book. So what James Bartholomew does is not only to describe the, the, the many ways in which the modern welfare state fails, right, in housing, education, uh, caring for the poor, caring for the unemployed, and so on. It's just a disaster from R to A to Z, if you just look at the facts. But what he does also is to uh, present the prehistory of the, of the modern uh, uh, welfare state in Britain. And here, uh, the UK presents a very... Um, uh, curious uh, exemption to the general rule, namely, the British Parliament in 1836, I believe, simply abolished virtually all welfare, public welfare institutions that there had been. Before there had been the Elizabethan, uh, Elizabethan um, poor laws, which obliged municipalities to take care of the poor and so on. And then the, the British Parliament just eliminated all of this in one stroke. Now, the consequence was, of course, much, much hardship for the people who were immediately concerned, so who had before some income coming from uh, uh, municipal uh, welfare, uh, 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 the municipal welfare state, and suddenly had nothing at all. But uh, at the same, there were two huge improvements that resulted from it. On the one hand, well, the incentives were now given for people that could no longer just rely on uh, pocket money handed out by the municipalities there to get a job. Right? So all who could got a job. And the second consequence that followed from this was the creation of a, a huge number of private welfare organizations, most notably the so-called poor societies. Oh, yes, good. Uh, 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 poor societies. Um, uh, da, 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 da. I forgot the name. No, 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 it was a, it's a, it's a, it's a special name of, of, of these organizations. There's local associations of people, right? So, for example, employees getting together in the same firm, they're setting up an association to help out all those who would lose their job, get sick, and, and so on, who pay into the same... Uh... Yeah, it was mutual aid, but there was a special name. I forgot, but it, but it fundamentally, it's a, it's a mutual aid. Friendly societies. Friendly societies, thank you very much. Uh, the friendly societies. Right? So there were literally thousands of those uh, uh, friendly societies all over, uh, all over England and, and the UK by the late 19th century. And under the impact of the welfare state, well, uh, why should you pay money into such a... Because you have to pay already taxes, and then the state provides these services anyway. So they've all been cr crowded out. Right? And uh, so it was friendly societies, uh, private hospitals, the glory of the, of the British medical system and, and our friend here knows this better than, than uh, all the rest of us, was in the 19th century. British uh, medicine was two levels, three levels above all the rest, or the rest uh, of the fray. And British medicine was based on volunteerism. Right? So the, the, the doctors went to the hospital, which was funded out of private money, in the morning, they, they cared people for free, and in the afternoon, they had their private clients. 
uh, which paid them uh, for money and so on. So it's, it's a splendid illustration of the fact how uh, market and voluntarism uh, operate or may operate in, in a free society. And I encourage all of you to read this book, James Bartholomew, uh, The Welfare State We're In. Uh, then what interventionism also does is to foster uh, materialism. That is, it destroys or at least greatly diminishes the willingness to dedicate your own resources uh, to, uh, to higher causes, right? Uh, and this occurs most notably by the destruction of the family, itself a consequence of the welfare state, uh, intrusions of the government in marital uh, contractual arrangements and, and so on, right? So we have huge divorce rates, we have uh, armies of uh, single mothers uh, raising fatherless children uh, because they can Right, because they, they get money f from the government, often they get money depending on the number of children that they have, right? So they have five children from five different fathers, gives you a good uh, a monthly revenue, and then they have no incentive to care for, for the children because they don't get paid for the quality of the children, but only for the quantity. And uh, so these are then the, the future unemployed uh, people or criminals and, and so on. And the, the statistics are, are crystal clear in that respect. Uh, corruption of intellectual life. Uh, intellectual life in a free society is an activity of uh, the leisure class, right? But now, not necessarily aristocrats, but people who have some money on their own, they, they have saved time and, and uh, also some money which allows them to pursue a scholarly activity or an artistic activity. That's how it works in the free society. In our society, virtually all intellectuals are employed by the state, such as myself. Right? Um, so, and of course, that brings with it a certain bias. Right? Being employed by the state, well, to be likely to be employed by the state, well, you need to make certain concessions, right? uh, both as far as beauty is concerned, but also as far as truth is concerned. You need to cultivate the, the, the art of a double talk and, and double logic. Right? There's a huge difference between the state and the mafia, of course, that's a satire, and, and, and so on. And then finally, also, uh, under the impact of monetary interventionism, there is a destruction, a tendency toward the destruction of um, what we can call the saturation mechanism of uh, capital accumulation. In a free society, uh, capital is invested to the extent that well, there's a remuneration because, because, uh, for it because, after all, that's a commercial uh, endeavor, right? And so as more and more savings get accumulated, well, the return on investment tends to diminish. There's a situation effect. As a consequence, as the return on capital diminishes, well, they, the opportunity cost for donations of time and of money diminish. And so uh, people then spend more time elsewhere, non-commercial uh, uh, activities, and they donate more money to philanthropic uh, activities. Now, the, the, the consequence of central banking is that it destroys the saturation mechanism because central banking allows for the leveraging of uh, investments. Now, that's, it's a bit technical, so I won't go into this, but the bottom line is that as the central bank allows you to invest, you make a lot of money even if the, the return on capital diminishes because you get yeah, I, I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you a few slides showing the evolution of um, monetary donations and the do and time donations in in the U.S. And okay, I can show. I cannot show you these slides here, but what, what they what they show is that monetary donations uh, to foundations in the U.S. in the past 50 years have been flat as a percentage of GDP and as a percentage of. Um, uh, net wealth, okay. Now what is important here is that th this statistic only shows the donations to foundations. And as we have just seen, as I've explained to you, foundations are essentially extension of commercial endeavors, okay. So uh, uh, various other forms of donations, or time donations in particular, are not involved. If we look at time donations, so people spend their money, there is, uh, we don't have a very long time series here, but there is um, uh, um, 
a database that has been uh, running since 2003, uh, run by the Bureau of Labor Statistics and the U.S. Census Bureau. And what that shows is um, that the time consecrated for um, uh, family members is declining, but at, at, at a very low level. So uh, less than 4% of waking hours are in the U.S. population, in average, dedicated to caring for family members, less than 4%, and the de uh, tendency is declining. Uh, less than 2% uh, are uh, dedicated to caring for non-family members, tendency also declining. On the other hand, time dedicated to sleeping is increasing, so Americans are now, thank you, sir, sleeping a few percent more of 24 hours, yeah? so this is uh, uh, monetary donations, right? So it's this flat tendency is around 2%. And here we have time donations, so this is for uh, the upper line here, this is family members, this is non-family members. And we have here the use of time, uh, so this is sleeping, right? So Americans are sleeping ever more of the day, right? So more than, it's almost 37% uh, uh, of, of, of 24 hours. And uh, of the rest of the time, more and more um, uh, time is uh, dedicated to leisure activities, uh, uh, sports, and, and so on. Right? And that's exactly what we would expect right? under the impact of, of, of the welfare state and of government interventionism in general. Right? Society becomes slowly transformed uh, into an army of narcissistic egomaniacs who just care about themselves. Okay, by and large, that's the general tendency. Wonderful. So I conclude in four points. Uh, first, uh, uh, for various reasons uh, that I've presented today, Cornwell's, Richard Cornwell's way of reclaiming the American dream is naive, superficial, and wishful. It just cannot work. Okay? Uh, second, uh, the true opposition is not between uh, uh, state and market. Um, in that respect, he is, uh, Cornwell is partially, um, uh, he's right, but between state and um, voluntary interaction. And voluntary interaction includes both commercial enterprise and non-commercial enterprise, right? So non-government organization and so on. And both relate to each other in various wage, ways which cannot be characterized in, in rigid uh, uh, categories. Third, uh, as we've seen, the, t the state tends to destroy the independent sector, as uh, Cornwell has called it, or civil society, as it is often uh, called today, in a similar way and for similar reasons as it destroys the market. And fourth, and that's what I explain in more detail in my book, the state tends to destroy civil society even more than the market because it attacks it at the root, namely the ability and will to sacrifice resources for higher causes, that is, for not selfish causes. Thank you for your attention.